Morning, morning, morning. My name's Andrew. If you're a visitor, um, I lead, I'm the leading elder the, uh, of the team over here. And I also serve uh, about just over 800 churches around the world in an apostolic type role. And so I want to dig into this morning, we, we're going through a series on, uh, on healthy church. What does a church, what is a church supposed to look like if it's built the way Jesus wants it to? And it's a real difficult question, especially because very often the things that we used to could be very different to what he actually loves. And so we want to dig into the Bible. And I think one of the basic premises of, of, that we're building from is if it's in the Bible and God has clearly showed this, then we want to do it that way. No matter how difficult it is, no matter how contentious it is, we want to do it the Bible way. And so I'm starting to move towards leadership which is probably one of the most important parts of how a church functions. Because show me your leaders and I'll show you the future of your church. It's a bit like um, uh, leaders define the boundaries of, uh, of the church, the values of the church, the health of the church. And so we need to look at what does the Bible speak about leadership and how does that work? We're starting it today. I'm going to be actually covering the concept of um, apostles. Do they, what are they? Were they for just 2,000 years ago? Do we still have them? Um, and if we do, what does that mean and how does that work? And so it's a huge subject. I've just re- written a book on it. Um, it will be released quite soon. Um, and it's a book. So you can imagine to try and condense that into one preach. It's going to be a miracle. So let's dig in and, um, and see how we do. Um, and basically, again, there's a lot of concepts about how a church should be governed or how a church should work. Uh, you have things like deacon boards in some churches that could hire or fire pastors, and you have pastors, you have um, senior pastors and other pastors and uh, youth pastors, and all these things are, th- are, are language and terminology that we've grown very used to today. The Presbyterian churches have a, a system where they believe the people should vote, um, and so in some ways the people decide every year what they're going to do and where they're going to go. Uh, You've got the Catholic Church, which has got a a pope at the top, and his word is in that church infallible. It's as though Jesus himself is speaking, and so they form themselves around that type of model. You've got denominations. You've got independent churches. You've got all these different churches doing all these different things. And I know we like to be in a culture that says, hey, your truth, my truth, who am I to judge? But the problem is the Bible is the Bible and God's church is God's church. And we've got to dig into the Bible to see what does God actually say. And if he's clear about these things, then we need to take heed and build according to his ways and his patterns. And so maybe to begin with, I'm digging into the concept of apostles. I'll touch prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Um, And so these are subjects that some of you might be familiar with. And hopefully by the end of this um, this will be very clear, and uh, you'll see how God has planned His church to work. And so I want to dig into apostles because in some ways they are a foundational gift or a foundational ministry or office within the life of the church. And when they're properly in place, everything else seems to fit. And we'll see this in the Bible as we dig in. So I'm going to spend a lot of time on apostles. I could do, I could do like a week on apostles, a week on prophets, a week... I, but we, we're condensing things because we don't have that much. Jesus is coming back before I finish the series, and that we're cool. All right. And so in Hebrews 3 verse 1, we're going to start digging into what is an apostle and, and what does the Bible say about this. And in Hebrews 3 verse 1, could you put that up for me? Um, we actually see that uh, Jesus is the first apostle. And um, he's sent from the Father, um, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, who share in the heavenly calling, that's us, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and our high priest. Jesus here fulfills two roles. He's a high priest, which is a separate subject. But here Jesus is called the apostle, um, and he's God's apostle in the sense that he is a sent one. And so let's dig into what does this mean? What does it mean that Jesus is our apostle? And uh, the word apostle comes from the Greek apostolos, um, and it literally, according to Strong's Concordance, means this. It's a messenger, an envoy, a delegate, one commissioned by another to represent him in some way. And so what you've got is you've got this picture of Jesus who's equal with the Father in every way, but makes himself less. 
and then is sent by the Father to the earth to represent the king and his kingdom. And so when Jesus comes to the earth, he is the sent one. He's sent from the Father. He says, I didn't come on my own authority. I was sent from him. And he is an envoy or a delegate from God. Even though he is equal with God, he plays a subservient role. You with me? And so uh, the root of the, the word, and we need to dig into this in, 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 the, in the Greek, it, it speaks of one not only sent, but one who carries the authority of the sender. In other words, a modern picture would maybe be an ambassador. Right now the world affairs are hotting up and there would be ambassadors sent and they would carry some authority from the government that they represent. So Jesus is sent from the Father and he carries some of the authority that the Father has. He says, I do not do things on my own authority, I do things on his authority. And so Jesus is the first apostle and I would say the one true apostle in the church because all the others that are gonna come that we're gonna look at are ultimately found in him and rooted in him and are under apostles of the great apostle over the church. All right. The word apostle is kind of one of those words and often we get stuck when we, to be honest, on most areas of theology because we don't understand how to read the Bible. The Bible is written in a Hebrew way of thinking, not a Greek way of thinking. So in Greek way of thinking, one plus one is two. But in a Hebrew way of thinking, one plus one could be two, it could be one, or it could be, the, the Hebrews were able to hold tensions that seem contradictory at times to us in our Greek linear way of thinking. Does that make sense? And so some of the times this word used is used in a very different sense to the classic sense of what is an apostle. And I want to show you in the Bible where the word, the, the word apostle is used not to mean one who is like an ambassador for somebody, but just somebody that is actually sent to do something. And, uh, and because the word has got kind of a lot of nuances in it. Okay, this is all going to tie together. In John 3.16, Jesus says, a messenger is not greater than the one who sent him. How many of you know that you're a sent one? Jesus said to you and me, go into all the world. Make disciples of all nations. You know, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In a broad sense, we are all Sent. We are all the Greek word here is apostolos. And we carry a messenger from our king to this world that you need to bow your knee and acknowledge he is the one true king and he has provided salvation. And so in some sense, all of you are apostles. But in another sense, you're not an apostle. You're an apostle in that you sent, but you don't necessarily carry all the same authority. We have within, it's, it's a bit like the Marines. You know, every, every, every Marine might be a Marine, but you would have different ranks within the Marines. And in fact, you would need all those ranks to be working properly for the unit that's actually out there fighting to know what to do, where to fight, make sure ammunition and, and uh, it's an entire. And so while we're all apostles in a sense, we're not all carrying the same authority. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm speaking, if you're getting so many Marines coming now, we're starting to use Marine applications. <laughs> and so yes, in a sense, and in another sense, that's the broad sense. We're all sent. You've been sent to this world. Go into all the world. It's a command of Jesus. The word here is apostolos. The messenger here, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. The messenger is apostolos. That's the Greek for, that we've just looked at in John but then there's sometimes the word is a bit narrower than just everyone sent, and it can be someone specifically sent. In other words, Jesus might come to an individual and say, I want you to go and do this. And so it now narrows down from all of us. Um, and uh, to illustrate this, the Greek writer Demosthenes, he wasn't a Christian. He's just telling us how the word apostolos was understood in culture in those days. He tells us that it was, uh, apostolos was used to describe a cargo ship sent out with a specific shipment to accomplish a mission. In other words, the Greek would say that ship is going to India or wherever to get spices. It is on a mission. It is an apostolos. It is sent to do something. And how many of you remember London and Margaret Whalen, who are elders in this church, and we planted a church in Carolina, and we felt the Lord, and they felt the Lord say that they needed to go and pick up the leadership of that church. And so we 
sent them specifically to do something. They were sent, they were apostolos specifically, and we would believe that Jesus was actually the one who said that, and we just heard that and acted it out. So they were sent to a specific, in a specific scenario. Does that make sense? And then it can narrows even more because um, we know that, that when you look at the 12 apostles, there was a very different, they, they weren't even just the broad or the narrow. They seemed to carry something different in the way that they were sent by Jesus. They were called to, and we'll look at just now what they were called to do. And so when Jesus began his ministry, the first thing he did was he raised apostles. And to be honest, any healthy church, any healthy movement should be founded on that same principle of this is the gift that Jesus uses first to establish everything else. And so he, he chooses these 12 men, and we know he goes up the mountain, prays, and, and these are the guys, and he lays hands on them and appoints them to be apostles. And they travel with him for three and a bit years. Uh, they watch his crucifixion. They enjoy his resurrection. They see that. And then um, one of the 12 fails, Judas. And when they need to replace him, we see something interesting because we can start to see what their specific role was for the church as apostles. Their role is different from anyone else's role. There's no one in history that will again have the role of this original 12 and then the one that was replaced. And this is, we see this in Acts 1, verse 21 and 22, when they're discussing how to replace Judas. And, and again, there's no other person that will ever be like those 12. And this is the reason, this is what their specific reason, the thing that God called them to do, this is what it was. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us. In other words, from the time of Jesus' baptism, the whole of his ministry, those, that time, we need a, this kind of apostle has to have done that. All right, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. In other words, to his death, seeing him resurrected, and then watching him ascend to be with the Father. These apostles had to be one of those. Now, we know there were 120 believers. Not all 120 were called to be apostles. There were 12 of the 120. They were called to be witnesses. And this is really the key. One of these must become a witness. So the first 12, their primary purpose is simply to be a witness. We were there. We saw him calm storms. We saw him raise the dead. We were there. We were there through everything. We are our witnesses of what Jesus said and what Jesus did. And there never will be another apostle like these 12. Even Paul isn't like these 12. And we know this because the Bible tells us they have a unique place in eternity. And in Revelation 21 verse 14, we actually start to see looking forward now towards the Lord coming and heaven coming to earth and the Lord establishing his rule and reign on the earth. And the Bible tells us um, in Revelation 21 verse 14, about this heavenly city, this heaven as it comes down. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. In other words, there will never be another apostle like those 12. They were chosen by the grace of God to do something that no one else did. And even though later apostles, like Paul did actually more than any of them, I would argue, it doesn't change the fact that God chose them to be the 12 and so when God chooses, it's not based upon our merit or what we do. It's based upon his call. God called these 12, and their names are written and laid into the foundations of eternity. They have an honor that no one else will ever have. And so everyone else from them is an under-apostle of those original 12. No one is the same. No one has the same authority. In a sense, now we're starting to see this word is, is it's starting to morph and, and, and take shape as we look at how this works. Does this make sense? All with me. I know you might be thinking, what has this got to do with me? Everything. Because if you're in a church, as we dig into this, that doesn't build this way, well, then you're in a church that isn't building according to the pattern of Scripture. And then you're in a dangerous place. And so we need to now dig into the other apostles. Are there other apostles? And if you're like me, I, as a young I actually did Bible school, and I was convinced there was a 12 in Paul, and that was it. I didn't think that there'd be anything beyond that. But I was shocked to find, firstly, experience 
the gift and then to see it in the scriptures. And so let's dig into, are there more than these guys, than the original 12? In Romans 1, 1, we see a new apostle emerging. He's different from the others. He never walked with Jesus for the three and a half years of his ministry. He did see Jesus resurrected. And so he has a unique, even he has a kind of, he's kind of in a unique echelon of this grace, of this gift, of this office. And we see Paul telling us in Romans 1, 1, Paul is servant of Christ Jesus, and I love that. He, he, he postures himself as a servant, but I'm called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. And so now Paul's clearly telling us that God called him and said, you're also going to be an apostle. Different from them, because you went to witness. You, you went there at my baptism. You went there through the... You, but you're also one. You're different. Your name isn't in the heavenly Jerusalem. But you're one who will build upon the foundations of those original 12. And, um, and Paul has a unique role. And I would say Paul and the 12 have a, a distinct role from anyone else and anyone that will ever come from then until Christ returns. In other words, there'll never be another Paul and there'll never be another 12. They stand unique. And, and Paul says that he has a unique role, and this is his role. Ephesians 3, verse 2 to 3, he starts telling the Ephesian church what God called him to be as an apostle. What was the specific message or the thing that he was carrying for the church? And it's this. I'm assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, God gave me a stewardship of grace, of how grace works in the life, how the death of Jesus applies to you, how the mystery is made known to me by revelation, as I have written briefly. And so Paul has this revelation of how grace works in our lives, which the apostles didn't get. And he knows, he brings a revelation of our Gentiles who have never been accepted by God properly as Gentiles, are now going to be embraced and brought into the kingdom of God. Paul is the one that gets this revelation and how it works. How do Gentiles and Jews become this one new man in Christ Jesus? And so he, again, in some ways is a boundary-laying, foundation-laying apostle. That teach, and again, we build on their foundations. Any new apostle cannot add or subtract to what they did. We can only look at what they said, look at what they did, and build on those foundations. Then are there more? Because this is a big question. Is that it? Is it the 12 and, and Paul? And actually, the Bible tells us there's many others who are apostles in the first century. I'll give an example. In Barnabas, in Acts 14, 14, Barnabas isn't one of the 12. He wasn't chosen to be an apostle then. Uh, we don't know when he got saved, but it doesn't seem like he fit the, 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 the first 12. And he certainly didn't get the revelation like Paul did. But it tells us, but when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard this. Now the Bible's telling us there's this other guy that no one knew about, and he's also called to be an apostle. So now you've got that, whoa, that many of us didn't, you know, I know you've read it, but did you join that dot in the sense of, whoa, suddenly this is another apostle, and he's another kind of apostle, but he's recognized alongside Paul. Then we've got Silas and Timothy are called to be apostles. In 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 1, uh, they write a letter together, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians. And so it's a letter addressed by three men, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. And then in 1 Thessalonians, the same letter, chapter 2, verse 6 to 7, they are writing, as apostles of Christ, we could have been a burden to you, but we were gentle among you like a mother caring for children. So now you've suddenly got this, these other guys. You've got Silas and Timothy who are now called apostles. And when you look at Paul's letter to Timothy and to also Titus, you start to realize they're actually doing what this new kind of apostle will do. And we'll look at that just now in some detail. So you're starting to see, whoa, whoa, this is a, quite a prominent gift in the Bible. In fact, there's more apostles mentioned in the New Testament than any other person, any other gift. Guess how many times, I mean, guess how many times te there's one teacher mentioned in the Bible? There's not one single person called a pastor in the whole Bible. We know that there are elders and they plural, but no one is called a pastor in the whole Bible. There are, there are evangelists. I think there were five evangelists. Some of them are girls, some of them are men. <laughs> There's a prophets mentioned. 
Silas is also called a prophet. And I think one of the daughters, oh, I've forgotten their names now. But, but a few prophets, but there's more apostles mentioned than anyone else in the Bible, any other function in the Bible. Which is kind of shocking when you think at the modern church. And to be honest, this is pastors and teachers, really, is what, what churches are built with today. Pastors and teachers are, the, are the, the foundations of how churches are built today, but I don't think it's right biblically. Then Apollos. In 1 Corinthians 4 verse 9, Paul's writing to the church with Apollos, and he's talking about himself and Apollos, and he speaks in the plural, for I think that God has exhibited us, and it's him and Apollos speaking, as apostles, as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we, become, we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. Epaphroditus, I'm just showing you there's more than just, in Ephesians, uh, sorry, in Philippians 2 verse 25, all right, but now Matt has compelled me to send Epaphroditus to you, a brother who is a helper and a worker with me, but your apostle and a minister, a capital A, and a minister of my needs. Now you've got this other guy. And so you start to go, whoa, how is it that they had so many of these gifts on these offices working in the early church, but today most churches don't recognize this gift at all. It's just not how we build church. And I think it's because we confuse the original 12 and we think, well, no one can write scripture. No one can add to what they did. And so we can't, but we don't understand the Bible has got nuance in this word. And we see others who are called apostles, but that don't do what those guys did. And we've got to hold these tensions together to be nuanced and balanced in the things of God. All right, so you're with me. I made my point that there's more than just... The other thing is this, there's also false apostles that the early church is struggling with. And I would say the same thing will happen today. And so in Revelation 2 verse 2, uh, the church is commended because you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found the false. This is the end of the first century. This is like AD 95. All the apostles, Paul's dead. All 12 of the apostles are dead. And there's still guys going around and the church needs to discern who are the real ones and who are the fake ones which tells you that there are real ones at the time, but that there's also fake ones. And uh, in 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen, 13, Paul writes, for such men, these are men that are coming into his churches, they're traveling ministries, traveling around the nations in the name of Jesus. And he says, but these men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. So even in the first century, you had these guys who were traveling saying, I'm an apostle. And Paul was saying, no, they're not the real thing. And I would say that same thing has happened today. Whenever you've got the real, you've got the fake. And the big question we have to decide is test those who claim to be and find out do they fit the bill? Do they meet the standard of Scripture? Are they the real deal? Are they fake? And, I, and one of the challenges we have whenever we go into new nations is, unfortunately, the fake seems to get there before the real. And so we come in and people, have you heard of the NAR, the New Apostolic Reformation? It's this kind of thing that happened in America. Um, and, um, and what happened was, there was a guy, and I won't mention his name yet, but he looked at churches and looked at some mega churches. And America has got some of the largest churches in the world. And he said, whoa, apostles are still relevant. So what he did was he created an apostolic council. You needed to have a church larger than a certain size. And then we would recognize you as an apostle, and you could come onto the apostolic council of America. And many of these men were more Bible teachers than apostles, but they had mega churches. And so suddenly you've got this group now that are calling themselves apostles, and unfortunately some did great damage to the church. And so people are a little bit gun shy of the concept because it has been badly used. But because it's badly used, it doesn't mean that it's false. We need to test to make sure this is this grace something that Jesus has given, or is it something that looks like Jesus has given, but there's a measure of dishonesty in this thing. And now let me say this too. <sighs> Very few people in the church are willfully dishonest. Very few of these deceitful apostles think they're deceitful. They think they're genuine. They're trying to serve Jesus, but they've somehow misunderstood something or they've somehow got duped to believe something wrong. And so now they're trying to function in a in thing that Jesus hasn't called them to function in. And it's the church's responsibility to test them and go, is this the real thing or is this fake? And if it's fake, kick it out. If it's real, okay, well, that has bearings on us. 
okay. No one can lord it over the church. No one can say, well, I'm the, you be, it, it, we can try and convince that I might be the real thing or that somebody might be the real thing, but it's the church to decide and discern, is this gift the genuine gift? And remember this, Paul's calling out false apostles, but some people are calling him a false apostle. <laughs> so because somebody says he's false doesn't mean he is. You've got to decide for yourself. In fact, his whole letter to the Corinthians is trying to say, I am the real deal. And they're saying, no, you're not. We prefer those other guys. And he's saying, they're the false. I'm the real. So the church generally gets us messed up. And we've got to be very careful to make sure that we do it well. <laughs> I mean, remember this. They did say Jesus was bills above the prince of demons, which is a bit confusing considering he was came to demolish. And so what people say is irrelevant. You need to test for yourself. You need to test for yourself. All right. <laughs> all right, so let's, uh, all right. Okay, here's the numbers. Four prophets in the New Testament, one evangelist is mentioned by name, one teacher mentioned by name, and no pastors are mentioned by name. That's my stats. Check me out on that. So why is it today that everyone's called pastor? <laughs> what have we done with God's ways? We see plurality of eldership, and I'll get, that's, a, that's coming later. Watch the space, follow the series. You'll see how that works. We'll get there. But I think we haven't understood how compromised we are in so many matters, including leadership. All right, and so in Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, we now see uh, Paul writing to the church about how Jesus is going to build his church. And it's, 412 is something I started. It's a, it's a field of churches. We'll look at what it is just now in the scriptures. Um, and there's others like 412 in the nations. But here we see how Jesus is going to build the church. And remember, he is, Jesus is the apostle. Jesus is the prophet. Jesus is the evangelist. Jesus is the shepherd of your soul. And Jesus is the great teacher. But when he ascends, he wants his body on the earth. And so what he does is he takes portions of grace and he calls men and, he says, I, and women and he says, I'm giving you this portion of myself to represent this part of me to my church. And so suddenly you find people among us that can prophesy or become prophets. You find those among us who become teachers. And they're given that grace from Jesus to build up the church. And this is what it's telling us. He, Jesus, gave the apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to, and this is for the reason, to equip the saints for the work of ministry. In other words, when they're working properly, you don't come to watch them. You come to be trained by them. Part of what I'm doing today is, is training you. I'm trying to teach you the ways of God so that you can also train others. And um, for building up the body of Christ. And it goes on, until we all attain. So this is going to carry on. Those gifts are going to be here. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith. Now, have we attained that yet? No. Just look how divided we are in San Clemente, let alone... Eric, put it up again. Unity of the faith. And in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Has anyone, have we yet attained the whole measure of the fullness of Christ? No, we haven't. We are being made like Him. Which tells us that these five gifts are going to be working in the church until Jesus returns. Because when Jesus returns, it says then... When he returns, we will be like him. Now we know in part, then we will be known fully, even as we are fully known. Then we'll have a proper knowledge of who he is. Now we see in part. How many of you find you're still learning about Jesus? Because you're seeing in part. You haven't attained the wholeness yet. And this will continue until Jesus returns. Nowhere in the Bible, anywhere does it say that these five gifts will stop serving the church. So why has the church stopped building with them? These remain until he returns. They'll keep building the church in every generation to align her properly with Jesus. And we'll look at that just now. Are you with me? And so there are, and it's not just gifts. I, I think people like to think, well, it's like a gift. Like Sarah can prophesy. How many of you, how many of you got a prophecy from Sarah before? She's sharp, isn't she? I heard this week she walked up to somebody and had no idea about this and walked up to someone and said, oh, you got a baby. And, and she was right. Person checked two days later, I heard. They didn't know. They didn't know. Two days later, they checked. Like, Whoa, how did she do that? Well, God knows everything. 
and he speaks. And he speaks through Sarah. She's carrying a gift. Now the question is, is Sarah gifted in prophecy? She's sharp. Or is she a prophetess? There's a difference. Because the Bible says we can all prophesy. Did you know that you can prophesy? In fact, Paul said, I wish that you would all prophesy. So it's something we can all do. If we train properly, if you stick around, you'll learn how to prophesy. We'll get you there. Because if you can hear Jesus for yourself, it's not hard to hear Jesus for somebody else. And as we build the church, so you will begin to learn how to hear his voice, and then you will learn how to hear his voice for somebody else. So you can all prophesy. But there's a difference between being able to prophesy and being a prophet. Just like we've got a doctor over here. Come stand next to me, doctor. Now, she is a doctor. It's not just, it's, it's who she is. And in some ways, if there was a crisis and somebody's been hit by a car, I might run up and I might be able to do some basic first aid. And I can, I can in some ways help the person, but I'm not a doctor. I can simply help to a measure. But she is a doctor. It's who she is. And so she's been set apart within society. And the minute she comes in, even though I might be helping, I'm getting out of the way because she's one who's actually called to be a doctor. In the same way, there are those in the church that can do certain things that are kind of apostolic, but when the right gift comes in, we go, okay, this is, this is person's called to be this in the church. It's not just like sent one. This is something that Jesus has delegated a responsibility to in a unique way, and so we align ourselves differently. Does that make sense? Thank you, doctor. <laughs> and, and we know it's because they're called to be apostles, called to be Doctors, call, you get what I'm saying? It's a spiritual thing here, but it's not just something I do and I'm kind of good at this. It's something that Jesus has actually said, I've set you apart to do this in my house. All can prophesy, but you will be a prophet. There'll be something distinct about what you do. You'll carry more weight and more authority and the believers will sense it when you speak. The spirit in them will resonate. This is, this is a gift that's larger than the rest of our house. And we need to heed the gift when it speaks because she just seems to hear God really well. And we see this, that they set apart. And we see this in Acts 13, 2 to 3. The Holy Spirit said, Set apart me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. And after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. When laid, hands are laid, it is commissioning into office. This is actually commissioning someone to do this work. Jesus, by the Spirit, is saying, Paul and Barnabas, you're going to be two men that are going to do something distinct from anyone else. You are God's apostles, and you will break open the Gentile world for Jesus. That was the grace that God gave them. Let me also say this then. That's what God gave them. Because someone else is an apostle doesn't mean they carry that same level of grace. We've got to weigh what grace does this person carry? What kind, of, what kind of thing has Jesus called this person to be in the church for the church? And it is for the church. It's not for them. It's to equip the saints. And I love that word, to equip the saints. And there's a lot of different words used for equip. It's katatismof in the Greek. It literally can mean to mend nets when the disciples are mending nets. And so some of these five gifts, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, when they're working properly, will help you to heal. When you come into the house of God, you come broken. The world has shredded you. You're like a net that can't catch fish. You can't do what God's called you to do. And Peter and John are mending katatism off their nets. And Jesus says, come follow me. And that word katatism off literally means when you come into a healthy church with the five gifts working, healing will start to become your portion. You'll start to find the broken parts you're getting whole as those different gifts work together. But also, some translations translate this word katatismov differently because it's a word that doesn't just mean healed. It kind of means perfecting. And so the King James Version, the ASV, the Berean literal, uses the word perfecting the saints for the work of the ministry. In other words, making you perfectly ready to do what Jesus called you to do. It's not just fixing you. It's kind of a soldier that goes to war is fully equipped. He has got every, you know, think of the Marines again. He's got everything he needs to go into battle. He's been trained completely. When he engages the enemy, he knows exactly he's perfected. He knows what this means. He knows what he can do. He knows how he plays. He is readied and made able. And this is the picture that we have of what we're supposed to do for you. 
Another, another uh, the Holman's Christian Standard Bible uses the word training the saints for the work of the ministry. And again, you've got this concept of being trained and equipped. Do you know that the things we're talking about here, uh, there's very few pastors in this nation have dived into. How many of you are finding this is quite new? You're like, whoa, whoa. Some of you have been Christians for years. But this is equipping you so that you know how the church works. Or to prepare the good, good, good God's word translation, the good news, to prepare God's people to serve. And so our job is to get you ready to serve Jesus because Jesus is going to send you into the world to make disciples of nations. So let's carry on. So some people say, well, Andrew, yeah, I don't know about all these gifts. The Bible is enough. And I'm saying the Bible is great, but when Jesus ascended, he didn't say, I will leave you my Holy Scripture. He said, I will leave you my spirit. And he will remind you of everything. Now, we never go beyond Scripture. Scripture is, we don't go beyond what is written. We, anyone, any apostle who goes beyond the Bible, run. Run. Because he's stepping into authority that God has not given him. We build on those foundations. But at the same time, the Scriptures in themselves are dead and inanimate, unless the Spirit breathes life into them. And, and I would still remind you of the seven letters written to the seven churches in Revelation. This is the end of the first century. Every single one of these churches has had Paul in them. They had Timothy, Silas, all these gifts. And they have the whole Bible at this point, except the book of Revelation. And five of the seven churches are terminally ill. And John, as an apostle, has to bring correction to them. If that's the case at the end of the first century, do you think anything's changed? So we're going to need these gifts until Jesus returns. And we need to know how this gift works in the church and how do we align ourselves with this church. In the New Testament, there is not one single church, not one, that is not in relationship with an apostolic person. How many churches in America? And if it is an apostle, is it an apostle according to Scripture or is it just some guy that's got a big church and a big ministry that doesn't understand the workings of the church. Just a, a Bible teacher can grow a huge church. In fact, that's normally how you grow big churches in this area. You're just a good Bible teacher. People love it. Because it's not that challenging. It just educates me, and I love education, so I'm going to that church. But the church isn't just a place to educate your mind. It's a place to train you to do the work of the ministry. And part of that is training your mind. You need teachers. All right. So the Bible tells us in Ephesians 2.20... This is how the church is built healthily. Are you all with me? Man. Yeah. T- fly, time just flies. I hope it's as fast for you as it is. Because this is <laughs> I hope you're not sitting there when's this guy going to end? <laughs> built, the church is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In other words, every single church that's built well has Jesus aligned. Everything's lined up with Jesus. He's the cornerstone, the, the stone that everything else is built around and on, okay? But it's built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets. Now, some people say, well, Andrew, that's the Old Testament, the prophets, and the apostles would be the original 12. But I think you're making the Bible say what it's not saying, because actually we see there were many other than the original 12 working in the first century church. And, we in, um, and Ephesians 2.20 tells us it's built on these foundations. But in Ephesians 3.5, which is just not even a full chapter later, Paul tells us this mystery which has now been made known to the sons of men in other generations as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. In other words, this is not the Old Testament prophets. This is the now prophets. It's not just the 12 It's the now apostles. In other words, these two gifts seem to work closely together if they're working properly to help align the church properly with Jesus. They're the foundation laying gifts. And when they function properly, all the other gifts will build on that foundation and the church will be healthy. But if you have somebody not one of those gifts trying to lay the foundation, it's like putting the wrong foundation into a house because you're getting a plumber laying a foundation. You don't want to live in that house. Do you get that? It's just, they're not called to do that. They're called to do something else. It's important to be a plumber in the house. Let me tell you, if you don't have a plumber in your house, you're going to have big, stinky problems. (laughs) But a plumber isn't called to lay a foundation. A plumber is called to build on the foundation. 
The apostles and the prophets lay the foundations. And so every generation needs apostles and prophets to come into the church and to make sure that the foundations are laid well. When you go read your Bible, the disciples are scattered through persecution and they're preaching the gospel everywhere. And churches are popping up all over, all over, the, 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 all over the Roman world. And what happens every single time the apostles in Jerusalem hear about it? They immediately send one of them to come into the church and immediately they're checking out what's missing in the church and they're starting to help the church be built properly to Christ because the foundations are laid by apostles and prophets. And could you put up that picture of that wall? Actually, I've heard a, an amazing story while this wall picture comes up. Uh, I heard years ago of an engineer who was very good um, and um, I think it was somewhere in, in the east uh, I read this account of um, a skyscraper that had been built many stories high. And um, the owners of the skyscraper who had built it had a crack forming up very high. I think it was on the 15th floor. A huge crack started to appear in the skyscraper, which is kind of a bit scary when you're in a skyscraper. And so they called this master engineer, this master builder, to come in and to help us. We've got this crack on the 15th floor. We've got a big problem. And so what happened was they, they, the owners, now obviously there's a lot of money invested in this, they, they've got this master builder, this engineer, and they, they get in the lift with him to go up to the 15th floor, and he doesn't press 15, he presses B for basement. And they're saying, no, the crack's in the 15th floor, it's not in the basement. And he goes, the crack's in the 15th floor, but the problem's in the basement. And so they go down into the basement, and this is what they found. The caretaker of the building was building a home for himself. And was chiseling out bricks out of the foundation every day and walking home with them in his suitcase, as many as he could carry. And over time, he had he'd weakened the foundations to the point that on the 15th floor, a crack had started to form. The problem wasn't the crack. The problem was the foundation. Normally, when churches are not built properly according to the foundations, the cracks show much later. They show much later. And the problem often isn't the crack. The problem is actually... A much deeper than that. It's, is this church properly aligned with Jesus? Is every part of it aligned with the truth of God's ways? You with me? Yeah. All right. And so Paul tells us, and this is probably for me what a modern day apostle, this is a primary gift. And this is how we would see uh, that many would say, this is what I would be doing within the church. I'm not Paul. I'm not one of the 12. I'm distinct because I carry, there's 800 churches around the world that I, this is what I do. This is what I work into. And they've recognized this grace on me. And your job is to see whether I'm the real or whether I'm the phony. <laughs> For we, Paul says, sorry, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 10 to 11. According to the grace given to me, Paul says, I lay, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. And someone else is building upon it. Let each one be careful how he builds upon it. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, the foundation that every church is going to be built on that's healthy is Jesus. And that's Jesus in every part of the church. In the thinking, the theology, the practice, every part of what that church is. All right? Paul says, be careful how you build. And he goes on to say you can build with wood, hay, or straw. Or, uh, I mean, I'm running ahead of myself. What a lot of churches do is this. They build upon uh, the sand of modern culture. In other words, modern culture is shifting, and we make our church relevant to modern culture. So instead of looking at the scriptures in the Bible and saying, what does Jesus want? We look at the shifting sands of time, and we go, we're going to build our church that people love. But it's sand. And you don't know that the house is dangerous until the storm comes. And it's only when the storm comes that the cracks start to form. And then we know that house wasn't built properly upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. The problem is when a wall cracks, the church cracks. And you end up with people getting hurt because now there's a tear, there's a crack that shouldn't be there. You end up in broken relationships because we don't know how to bring ourselves properly to Christ in these areas. You bring up in broken beliefs. We believe something that's wrong because we haven't aligned our beliefs properly with the Scriptures. And it becomes dangerous to abide to stay in that church. Are you with me? So be careful, Paul says, how you build. Be careful how you build. That's why this preach isn't about you, but it's really important for us to dig into. Because this will affect everything about you, if you understand it properly. 
All right, so two gifts, two gifts lay the foundations. And I'm going to skip this. I'm, going to, I'm skipping over some. I could, I could make this perfect, but I'm going to skip over some parts because attention span is only that long. Uh, <laughs> so Paul says this. I laid a foundation as a master builder. Now, if you're going to build a house, who would you like to build it? You can find a guy on the side of the street that says, I'm a builder. Or you can find a master builder. And normally you want to look at what he's built before to decide, I'm going to let this guy. And so in some ways, we need to find master builders. And this is the apostolic grace. It is a master builder. And it lays the foundation of Jesus well into every single part of the church. A master builder knows a couple of things. Because a, good, a genuine apostle never comes on his own because he knows he's only one part of the picture. And so when a man says, I'm an apostle, but it's his ministry, he's probably not the real thing. Because apostles will always work with the other gifts. In some ways, they're the first gift that the others build with. And so you'll start to find pastors and teachers and evangelists all popping up around a genuine apostle. And actually, at some point, you don't even need him there because Paul is planting churches and eventually handing things over because the nature of the gift is I'm working myself out of a job. When a church becomes dependent upon my ministry forever, I'm not an apostle, I'm something else. Which means you don't know how long you've got us for. I don't know how long you've got us for. I just know Jesus told us to be here now. So learn what you need to learn because the nations need to know this stuff. What if, and here's the problem, if other gifts lay the foundation. So in other words, let's say a teacher comes in and he says, I'm a teacher, I'm gonna lay the foundation. I'm gonna start a church and build it on my gift. Here's what you get. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Scripture. In other words, it's just, there's nothing of the Spirit of God moving normally. It's just very much come and listen to teaching. And you end up with people who love to hear and are very educated, but there's very little doing. There's very little of making disciples of nations. At best, you might have mission organizations, but the church isn't actually working as a unit with everyone doing their thing. People come to listen and take notes. It's not bad to take notes, but if that's the end, there's a problem. Or what about a pastor as the, as the foundation layer? Well, a pastor by his gift loves you, and you love him. So it becomes a really cool, safe place. Well, we love him, and he loves us. And it breeds us, we become dependents. He cares, he says, when I'm sick, pastor, you were there. But it never teaches us to grow up and mature. It's, it's a, it, it becomes wrong. What about an evangelist laying a foundation? Well, you end up with a bunch of lone rangers. Everyone's got their own ministry doing their own thing. There's a big front door, people getting saved every week, but they're not growing, so there's a big back door. People are just coming in and out, and that church just never seems to grow past a certain point because it doesn't have the right foundation. Or prophet. Ooh, this is a scary one when it's laying foundations on its own because now you're all mystical and deep and profound, and you're seeing angels in every doorpost, and it's all wonderful and mystical. But the problem is it ends up being a bit like the Corinthians where the gifts start to get out of proportion, and the church actually becomes unhealthy. But when you have the apostolic, the master builder coming, he knows we need the apostolic, we need the prophetic right now. And he brings that gift in. We need the evangelist right now. And because of the nature of his gift, those other gifts connect to him and he can bring the church what it needs. Are you with me? Yeah. So here's the thing. An apostle can normally do a bit of each of the, the others. And I've heard it said like a bit like a hand. If these are the fivefold gifts, the prophet is the first finger. It's pointing. It points Jesus, it shows Jesus to us, and it's telling us what we've got to do and where we've got to go. The evangelist is the middle finger, and they sometimes feel a bit like the middle finger when they're quite strong in, in how they come across. But they, they've got a lot of reach. They reach beyond the other fingers, and they tend to be able to reach out beyond the borders of the church and are able to draw people into the church. The pastor is the third finger. It's the wedding finger. It ties the church together in this community, and it, it teaches us that we're in covenant with one another. The, t the teacher is the pinky, the little finger. It balances the hand, and in some ways, all the other gifts, when that thing is there, everything seems to know how it works. But the apostle is the thumb. The apostle is the only one that can touch each finger. Quite. In some ways, the apostle can do each of the above, but he leans into other gifts, pulls them in as specialists, and so the five gifts start to work, and the church becomes healthy. Yeah. 
All right. Ah! I'm out of time. I hate that when I run out of time like this. I'm trying to go as fast as I can. I'm even, you know, the danger as a pastor is you always, as a teacher is you, you're trying to, you're trying to, you're trying to, uh, well, I'm teaching now. You're trying to bring people with you on this journey so I can, I can only move so quickly. Otherwise, I just, it just becomes boring. And then at the same time, I just can't get to where I want to get to. All right. Let me see what I want to, can I land this and just leave a whole lot out? All right. Let me see. Let me see. Yeah, that's somebody that loves my preaching. Somebody else is going, please don't. <laughs> All right. All right, so can I try 10 minutes? Is that all right? See how, if I hope I can land in 10. All right. So the apostolic in some ways is, um, if Jesus is the architect, Hebrews 11 verse 10, Jesus is the one who writes down the plans of the church and it's all in the scriptures. The apostle is the blueprint, the master builder. He looks at the, he looks at the plan and he knows how to apply it into this context and to pull the right gifts to help it build. But the apostolic also is one, if you look in the New Testament, is always the one correcting and bringing correction to the church. All right. And so in some ways, the apostolic works with local elders. And in 2 Timothy 4, verse 2 to 3, we know Timothy is called an apostle. And Paul has left him in Ephesus. He's left uh, Titus in uh, Crete to, to establish churches, to raise elders. And here the apostolic comes in and it says, to, Paul's speaking to a young apostle, Timothy, and says, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. And so here you've got this gift, and it's actually supposed to, in some ways, exhort. It's supposed to, uh, what's it, uh, reprove, to rebuke, um, and to teach with patience. One of the challenges I have is I can't move faster than you. And part of the challenge is sometimes because we say it not perfectly or we're saying it in a way that you don't quite hear, but sometimes it's also because Jesus is flipping over tables in his house and it's a bit offensive. And, um, and, and so there is a sense that it's, it's hard to process some of these things, but there is a sense that this gift needs to come in and it needs to pull things back to the center. And it needs to call things out that aren't built right. Jesus came to the temple. He flipped over tables, the great apostle. He said, my father's house will be a house of prayer for nations, but you've made it a den of robbers. And so this apostolic gift comes and it flips over tables. And that's what the gift does in churches. And these are tables that we put lovingly out there, and we love those tables. They've been there forever. But if it's not according to the Scriptures, then the gift needs to flip them over. Because this is the Father's house. It's not our house. And so when things are said, we need to talk and process. And I'm asking you to keep doing that with me. This last Wednesday was the first time I've had a few people, and, and some of the things I didn't say well, there were some loose ends that I needed to tie up. But it's important that we talk these things through and go back to the Bible, because otherwise, we're never going to grow. And I need to grow to communicate things better in this context. But likewise, sometimes there's things in, in you that need to get tweaked. <laughs> <laughs> all right let me land this all right and part of the challenge is the, to know the right ratios it was interesting one of the persons had a legitimate concern and, and I, I'll use the word right ratios and I'll maybe illustrate with this a point when we planted our church in Cape Town in 19 I've got five minutes in, in 1999 uh, uh, we grew very quickly and we eventually you know got felt the Lord tell us to buy land and to build a building. And so we started building this building, uh, still there today. And uh, we built it. We had a, um, a man who was a Christian who we, uh, we employed as a builder. And his company was exploding. It was doing really well. And he came in at a good price. And so we employed him to build the building. And we got it up to about, uh, it's probably about the height of those lights, which is quite, the foundations have been laid and the whole building is that high. And we had our engineer come in. And we just thought it was a random check, and he looked at the building and started looking more and more, and eventually started looking concerned, and then said this, your builder's using the wrong ratio of sand to concrete or cement. There's too much sand. And so actually, this building, even though it's that high, the pillars are not to spec, and this building is dangerous. You cannot carry on building. 
And I remember just thinking, I mean, I'm a young pastor. This is a long time ago. I was like, what? Do you know how much money it cost us to get it that high? Like, we sold cars. We, we, we gave everything for that. What do you mean? And this is a legitimate builder. So we went to the builder and said, what, what's going on? And he said, I'm really sorry. I'm growing so quickly. I've employed my sons to do my building, which I used to do. And this has happened on three sites. And so I'm actually going bankrupt right now because I can't afford to fix it. The Bible, I, there was a part of some of the people in the church said, let's sue him. But the Bible says you don't take a believer to court. Rather be, rather be defrauded. So we chose, rather, we'd rather be defrauded. We're not going to sue him. So we end up with this building that's that high. And it's failed. We can't carry on building. We've got no more money. And for the next six months, every single weekend, we would get together as a church and we tore that thing back to the ground. We try to save every single brick because we use bricks in South Africa, not wood to build. Every single brick was worth money. And I remember we would break the wall down and then the kids and the moms would sit there chipping cement off the bricks because we wanted to use them again. And we had to start building all over again because we had the wrong ratios. In a church, when any doctrine comes in and it's not in its proper ratio, it fails the test of God's perfection. You end up with something that's skewed. And one of the challenges was I spoke about, and I, and, and I want to bring these as, because I think these are great learning moments. And then I'll land with this. You know, I spoke about accountability. I spoke about actually leaders who will give an account. And it's biblical, Hebrews 13, 17. But the problem is this. Just up the road was a, a group of churches that got very far down into the heavy shepherding, the discipleship movement, which became known as the heavy shepherding movement. So what they did was they looked at these concepts of leaders giving an account, and they, they took this concept, which was not at all in Californian culture, too far, which is often the case when guys build. So what they did was they, they stretched this teaching and eventually came down to the point that you can't buy a car unless you speak to your pastor. You can't marry unless you speak to your pastor. You can't do anything unless you speak to your pastor. And it became known as the heavy shepherding movement. It was out of balance. Now, the problem now is this. California is out of balance here the other way. Everyone does this. They just, there's no concept of, you know, I'm my own Lord. Don't, no one tells me what to do. So it's that way. So I'm trying to pull it this way. But as I'm trying to pull it this way back to what's biblical, People who have had that experience go, whoa, were you that? And I'm like, if I was that, I wouldn't be a good builder. Yes, they built badly. But because they built badly doesn't mean that we will. A master builder knows how to get his ratios right. And you'll only know if I am a good builder by looking at what I've built and by watching me as I'm building it because I could start well and finish badly like the Galatians. The problem is this. As we move, at times we need to bend the church certain ways. We need to supply what's lacking in the faith of the church. And so we've got, oh, I'm out of time, so I'll land you. There's so many other things I wanted to say. We'll just land this. But we need this gift. Let me land with this. We need this gift. And we need the other four gifts with it. Working together to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Jesus said, I'll build my church. I'm going to use apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the, to build the church. If we think we can build the church differently, what did we smoke? <laughs> if we think we can do it with just a teacher, what are we thinking? Are we cleverer than God? And so what we've got to do is we've got to come back to these things. And we've got to grapple with these things and make sure that each of these gifts is playing in their rightful place, that the apostolic grace is working into the church. And that's why I'm here, to try and these guys felt I was that and asked me to come in and help, to lay in good foundations, to align everything with Jesus so that you can grow healthy and become a strong, beautiful reflection of him, that you can become equipped for ministry because this nation needs to see healthy church. And we get the chance to become it. And so these are the things we do. And so again, if you've been here, this is what we're doing. This is why this is not actually about you. You know, most people go away. They, but actually, it's very important to you. Because if we get this stuff right and you understand it, we can build churches that will actually be built properly on Jesus. And if Jesus builds the house, the gates of hell will not prevail against what he builds. We'll stand the storms. We'll keep going. Because Christ is the foundation stone. 
as I want to close in prayer with you. Why don't we close us? Thank you for your patience. I've gone an hour. Father, you are the architect and you're the builder. And as you build, you've called these gifts out to be those that helps the church be the church, to equip the saints for work of ministry. Lord, I pray for us as a people that we'll understand these things and we'll learn how to embrace them. For those of us that this is brand new and we've got questions, help us to work our way through these questions to land where you are, Jesus, what's clear in the Bible. And I pray for us, God, that as we grapple with these things together, that we will not only know about them, but that these things will become part of who we are and how we do things. That God, this church, this church would shake the foundations of this nation like your first century church did when she was built on these same foundations. Raise up a people, Lord. Raise up a people who will be wholly given to you and to your ways, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. 